If you have never been to an auction, I have actually seen Spanky sell a $100 bill one time for $1,600. It was the most incredible thing. And when he was like, what do you want me to talk about? I'm like, I want you to sell something. And he goes, no, I don't want to sell something. I want to teach something. I go, no, 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 no. I want you to sell something. So thank you, Spanky, for doing both, teaching us something and selling something. You're absolutely amazing, as always. We're learning a lot today about the way that you shape your mind. And so I did ask Brad Thacker if I could kind of pick on him for just a minute. Uh, what is the thing in the next 60 days that you're going to get done, Brad? Okay. Are you going to? Like it's a have to? Is it absolute or is it desire? Yes, when you say it out loud, that's what kind of freaks us out. Thank you for letting me do that, by the way. Brad actually wrote a book, finished writing the book over a year ago, and then kind of set it on the shelf. And I relate to that as it took me nine years to write my first book. So it can be a very intimidating thing for a person to do, but if you guys meet Brad afterwards, I was just kind of picking on him, encourage him. Tell him you plan to buy his book as soon as that thing is published. And speaking of which, I've written a couple. And so there's a few of them out here that are for sale. We also have some courses that are going to be for sale as well. Uh, Brad was going to come talk about that, but his ADD kicked in and he got distracted back there. Uh, we have some great stuff for you. We're going to do two drawings before we finish with the, our last speech. One of them is going to be for $100 worth of books. The other one is going to be for a $1,000 coaching package. And then our very last session for the VIPs is going to be a panel discussion with everybody that's spoken today so you get a chance to ask them anything that you want to. So I'm going to introduce my friend and a gentleman that I got to know over three years ago now. My very first trip out to this cool little town called Lewiston, Idaho, I'd gotten a contract to go work with St. Joseph Regional Medical Center, and I met this guy on my very first day of coaching there named Brett Beitlich, and I mispronounced his name for the first six months that I knew him, and he waited six months to correct me, and it wasn't the Brett part that I mispronounced, just to be clear here. I called him Beitlich for like six months, and finally he goes, it's bite lit, ch, ch. You got the ch, and I'm like, oh my gosh, why didn't you correct me sooner? Brett has a great sense of humor. I've been able to work with him for, we've actually been coaching together and training together for over a year now. He moved here to Amarillo from Idaho last September in the middle of a snowstorm, so it was a great time to be here. Brett is an established leader, business coach, and veteran with over 20 years of experience developing teams in the healthcare sector. He'll be discussing the magnanimous leader and how creating a culture of others first can establish the foundation of a lasting organization. He will explain and give examples of how you lead as a magnanimous leader. Work becomes less stressful when you do so, more enjoyable, and less about what you didn't do and more about what the possibilities are in your life. So please put your hands together and help me welcome Brett Beitlich. Nice job, nice job. You got it right this time. I know, I know. It only took a couple years. Yeah, a couple years. So, thank you all for having me today. Magnanimous, big word, right? I'm a Northern Idaho boy. I promise you 10 years ago, I couldn't say the word, I couldn't spell the word, I had no idea what it was. So, I'm gonna break this down a little bit. We're gonna learn about what magnanimous is, the definition, all those types of things. So, good old Webster, where's my millennials? Millennial, give me a hand up, all right. There used to be a thing called a dictionary. It was a book. Now I know millennials, they'd just be like, hey, Google, right? So Webster tells us that magnanimous is showing or suggesting of a lofty and courageous spirit, right? Courageous spirit. Doesn't that sound pretty good? I love a courageous spirit willing to go and do something, make a move. It also talks about suggesting nobility of feeling and generosity of mind. All right, so I'm gonna go act on it and I'm gonna think that I can do it, right? Magnanimous. I'm gonna go do great things and I'm gonna think that I can do great things. 
Let's break it down even a little bit further. Let's break it down into Latin, where like, you know, 80% of our language comes from in America. So magnus means great, and animus means soul. So I'm magnanimous. I'm going to go do great things. I think I can do great things. And it really means I have a great soul? Who doesn't want a great soul? No? We all want a great soul, right? We all want to think and do great things. That's why we're here. That's why we're coming to conferences like this to learn and be better. So how do we break those characteristics out into a leader? Anybody have any ideas? Not everybody at once. Settle down. What are some good characteristics of a leader? Nothing? What's that? Servant, servant leader. That's uh, one of those like 2000 terms, servant leadership, which I like the idea behind servant leadership, but you don't got to take everybody's monkey as Mr. Holland would tell us, right? So characters of a good leader, they listen, they're empathetic to what's going on because sympathetic is different than empathetic. I think Jody talked about that this morning. I wasn't here, but right? <laughs> I know he does talk about it, right? They can be trusted. They trust that you're going to do what you say you're going to do. They do the things that they say they're going to do. So now we know some of the characteristics. What about magnanimous people of today? Anybody know anybody that they think is magnanimous? There's a couple in this room. There's probably a lot in this room. There's two that I know pretty close. You got Mr. Holland, created his own business because he wanted to be a coach different than other coaches, right? He wanted to create a new mold. That's pretty magnanimous. That's pretty courageous. He wanted to be different. He wanted to create leaders that other people would follow, not just somebody who gave orders. You got Adam Beckner, created his own business. Why? Because he wanted to live a different lifestyle. He didn't create his business because he wanted to get glory and fame and be something awesome, even though he kind of is. But he wanted to create a new lifestyle for himself and he wanted to live by that lifestyle. That's pretty magnanimous, right? It's pretty courageous. When I asked Adam about that, he was like, you know, it's pretty simple to me. You have to do the common things in an uncommon way. And I was like, excuse me, what? You do, um, do the common things in an uncommon way. So you're going to do the same thing as everybody else. You're just going to do it different? Yeah, pretty much. And it works. It's magnanimous. So let's go, let's go back, right? Because, yeah, we have magnanimous people today. But what about people before? Oh, too far. Sweet. Let's start with Mr. Aristotle. Anybody heard of Aristotle before? Pretty cool Greek philosopher dude in the BC time. I mean, look at that face. How could you not like that guy? He just looks badass, right? Aristotle, he, uh, he's kind of the, the father of the magnanimous. He thought that to be magnanimous was a virtue. Ooh, that's a cool word too, a virtue, right? Virtues are something that live inside of all of us and that others desire, right? He thought it was an expression of greatness. Not only did he think it was an expression of greatness, but he thought if you thought yourself as great and of nobility, and I don't mean nobility like prince and king and all you peasant servants type of nobility. I mean, like you thought yourself lofty, If you thought yourself lofty and great, you would attract others around you that were also great. And not only would they be great, but they would make you even better. Because I don't think greater is a a great word to use right there. Great, great, greater. That's that's a lot. (laughs) Um, Let's talk about William Wallace. Who's seen Braveheart? Yes, right? William Wallace, ah, right? What'd he do? He gathered up his countrymen from all over the place. 
And he said, we're gonna be independent. That's pretty magnanimous. That's pretty darn courageous. Let's go to Mr. George Washington, father of our country, right? So George had this idea. He's thinking, you know what? I don't want a country that's ran by a president. I want a country that's ran by the people. So he helped us create a republic. Pretty magnanimous, right? It wasn't for him, he became president, but he did it because he wanted a better life for his people, for the country. Let's move on to Mr. Abraham Lincoln. Everybody knows what he's famous for. I don't need to teach a history class, but I want you to imagine this, okay? Mr. Abraham Lincoln and Mr. Grant standing on the hop, top of a hillside and they're like, yeah, we just won. And Grant's like, I'm gonna go shove it in their face. I'm gonna go tell them how awesome we were and how much they suck. You know what Abraham said? No, nah, no, nah, you don't understand, man. That's to our countrymen. He said to be harsh or spiteful or to punish them or to throw wind in their face was not going to do anybody any good. That's pretty magnanimous. I mean, the guy just won a huge battle. And he was like, no, 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 these are our countrymen. They're part of us. We need to take them along. We need to bring them in. So move on to Mr. Winston Churchill, right? The half American, half British bulldog is what they used to call him. Very powerful, great leader. He has this famous quote that he says, in war, we find resolution. In defeat, we find defiance. In victory, we find magnanimity. And in peace, we find goodwill. So just like Abraham Lincoln, Winston Churchill thought through victory, we can still be magnanimous. We can still bring others along regardless of what role they played. What about Nelson Mandela? Who's heard of Nelson Mandela, right? Yes, amazing leader. Huge sacrifices for his countrymen, huge. Imagine what this guy went through. Imagine being in his shoes. Here he is in the middle of a giant racial struggle. He's got African-Americans on one side, they're super bitter. And he's got white people on the other side that don't understand what's going on. And what's he do? He bridges that gap. Again, not for his own glory, not so he could lift himself higher, but so that the people of his country, regardless of their race, could have a good place to be. Pretty magnanimous, right? The last guy I wanna talk about, which is kind of out of order, but I wanna talk about C.S. Lewis. He was a British writer, wrote amazing, amazing books. He wrote one book that I, I've read two times through now. It's, it's not the easiest book to read, but it's good. And it's called The Abolition of Man. And in The Abolition of Man, he talks about the chest, what's inside of us. Is magnanimity and sentiment. And they are indispensable liaisons between the cerebral man, what's in our mind, and the visceral man, which is what we are. It's our body. There's a liaison. Magnanimity is a liaison. It teaches us what we say in our mind and what we do directly correlates to our body directly correlates to our actions. So if we wanna be magnanimous, if we wanna be great, look out for others, not be selfish, be a good leader, starts here and then we act it through here. So now we know what magnanimous is. We know the definition. We know some people associated to it. We got a little history lesson. How do we be 
come magnanimous. The clicker does not like me today. All right. Remember, we can't change a culture without first changing ourselves. So first we're gonna look and find the bigger picture of you. What role do you play? Um, there's an exercise that Joey and I have done for some other clients that talks about what level are you at? What role do you play in an organization? The idea about being magnanimous, it doesn't matter what level you're at. We all have a part to play. You just need to understand what role you're at and what role that you need to do. We're going to, when we create teams, we need to create them with a team mindset. So together, togetherness. Understanding that if we think of our team or our organization as a machine, and in a machine, if you take out a cog that runs the gears, what happens? It usually breaks apart, right? It shuts down, right? So togetherness is huge in creating teams. We all have that part to play in it, right? It takes every cog in the wheel. Having been in the healthcare industry for a long, long time, quite often I would hear in administrative meetings talking about environmental services. Environmental services is, for lack of a better term, the housekeeping of the hospital. And I wouldn't see them at meetings and I wouldn't hear feedback from them about how things were going, what we could do and improve. And I'd, I'd ask the question, I'm like, why aren't they, in, they involved? And some people would say, well, they're just housekeeping. I'm like, what do you mean they're just housekeeping? When you walk in a hospital, what's the first thing you see? How clean it is? How disorganized it may be? Right? It's visual. If I walked in a hospital and I saw a bunch of dirt and grime all over the floor, I might think twice about hanging out there. Right? They're supposed to be the cleanliest places that we go to. And EVS fills that role. So they need to be at the table. Equality. Much like togetherness, we all have a voice. Like the example I use with EVS, they needed to be involved. They need to be involved from day one because without them, we could get an automatic negative perception as soon as somebody walks in. And they have just as much of a voice as anybody else. Not always did that make me popular in the administrative world. The fact that I would take somebody off the floor and be like, hey, so-and-so, what do you think we could do to improve? What are you struggling with? Some administrative folks would be like, whoa, whoa, what are you doing? I'm like, I don't know what they do. I don't know how that role works. I need to find out what they need for help. They're as equal to making this work as I am. Just because I have some fancy badge or some lofty title that makes me better? Absolutely not. You need everybody. Actions speak louder than words. So if I say one thing and I do another, what happens? They don't trust you. This is something I talk to my kids about all the time because they're little. And I don't know why, but I think they should think like adults. My wife keeps telling me it doesn't work that way. One day I might agree, not today. But I'll be like, hey, you say you're gonna pick up your room. And then I walk in your room and your room's not picked up. I can't trust that you can pick up your room on your own, right? But when we're creating a team, if somebody says, hey, I got this, I'm gonna do it. We gotta trust that they're gonna do it, right? And we gotta trust that their actions are gonna speak louder than their words. They're gonna follow through. They're gonna make it happen. And we need to be motivated by change. Change is inevitable. If you think that change will not happen in your organization, I have to say you're kind of ignorant. It happens. It happens all the time. Our life changes. I would have never thought a year and a half ago to get on an airplane, I'd have to have a mask or I have to carry around this card that says I have this. I would have never thought that ever but it happened. It's real. It's here. I could fight it. 
Or I could just say, I could be part of this change. I can understand how I fit in that role. So we know the definition. We have some steps to becoming magnanimous. Now we need to make This thing loves to skip one on me. Sweet, perfect. Thank you. Now we need to make the magnanimous investment, right? Because it's not enough to say, I know the steps, I'm gonna do it, it's gonna happen. Here we go. We need to make an investment in it. We need to make a lifestyle change. We need to decide who we're gonna be, where we're gonna go, what we're gonna do. We need to learn the ability to trust and be trusted, much like the example I gave. If I'm going to give an action or direction or request to do something, I need to trust that it's gonna happen. And when I trust that it's gonna happen, I in turn will gain trust from that other individual. They will trust in me as well. So when I trust, I get to be trusted. Learn what you can and can't do. I used to think I was a pretty intelligent guy. And then I became a leader. And I learned maybe I'm not as smart as I thought I was. Because I thought I could do everything. And quickly, when I started listening, I learned there's a lot I can't do and a lot that I don't know. So when you're a leader, sometimes it's, it's scary to be like, uh, hold on, I, I don't know how to do that. A classic example that I used to love was we'd promote somebody as a new director in the hospital and we'd be like, okay, we need to get your budgets done by next week. And you could just see it. My what? My, my budget? I don't know what that is. And so I started asking the question, like, why aren't we setting these folks up for success? Why don't we teach them what a budget is, how to build it, break it down? Not just, here you go, fill it out, right? Learn what you can and can't do and understand you're enough. When you get promoted to being a leader and understand you don't have to have a title to be a leader, right? You can be a leader anywhere. You can be a leader at home. You can be a leader in your community, at your church. If you're at work and you're a manager or a supervisor or an administrative person, you understand that you're enough. You were put in that position for a reason. Someone saw something in you that maybe you don't understand. Maybe it's something that you didn't even know was within yourself, right? Understand that you're enough though. You got put in that position for a reason and accept that you're enough. So, We learn the definition, we learn some history, we learn some steps, we're gonna make an investment in being magnanimous because being magnanimous is awesome and it creates awesome relationships that you can lean on in the future. Now we're just gonna be magnanimous. We are gonna take those steps that we've learned, the definition, we know what it means already, right? We know examples to look back to William Wallace, one of my favorite examples, only because Braveheart's awesome and one of my favorite movies. We need to start leading through our actions, not our words, right? For the better of others. When I can make a decision that is for the greater good of my organization, to use a Simon Sinek quote, which is, I think he's like my man crush. I love that guy. He writes very simplistic books for simplistic Idahoans like me that can't read very well. But he says, when I can make an investment in others and I can move that needle, I'm playing the infinite game, is his term, the infinite game. I'm not looking at this quarter's numbers and letting all my emotions be associated to those. I'm saying I have created a team that can go through anything, do anything, the ups and downs of the stock market, the highs and lows of sales, whatever it may be associated to your organization, 
When I can create that team and we're all on the same page, I'm playing the infinite game. I have no worries that my organization won't be around because I'm not focused on the right this second. I'm focused on creating something that moves forward. Lastly, you need to believe in you. Many of the speakers have talked about it today. It all starts with you. You are step number one. When you believe that you can do anything that you envision, you create yourself magnanimous behavior, right? Go back to the definition, great, right? Believe you're great, act great, in your mind you're great, great actions. It's pretty simple. Anybody not wanna be magnanimous? Who wants to be magnanimous? Yeah. Right? It's, it's so awesome. It's so great to think my actions are associated to others and when they win, I win too. Thank you all very much. I appreciate it. I hope you enjoy your day. Good job, Brett.